for supporting their oppressors. And today, Western society finds itself caught up in this affair. For in the name of security and the preservation of our liberties, we now live in a world in which CIA agents are accused of operating outside international law to drag Islamist suspects off the streets of Western capitals and spirit them away to a brutal fate in Arab prisons. But mistakes have been made, innocent men taken, fueling yet more bitterness and anger. Following the 9-11 terror attacks in 2001, the American administration established a detention center at its naval base in Guantanamo Bay. The prison camp is a legal black hole. The prisoners here are called illegal combatants in the war on terror. They are detained without charge or trial. Yet journalists have now uncovered an even darker story of capture and detention practiced by the United States and its allies. The practice has been called extraordinary rendition. Approved by the White House, it involves capturing and secretly transferring terror suspects to countries where they can be interrogated with fewer legal protections. The policy was set up under the instructions of President Bill Clinton his national security advisor, Sandy Berger, and his counter-terrorism czar, Richard Clark. Former CIA analyst Michael Scheuer is widely regarded as being the man who helped establish the policy of extraordinary rendition. And the agency said, uh, no, we're not, we don't have jails and we don't have arrest power. Where do you want these people taken? And uh, Mr. Clinton and Mr. Berger and Mr. Richard Clark simply said, it's up to you. So we tried, we needed to design a program that uh, we would focus on Al-Qaeda people who were wanted in a particular country for a, a crime. It was in Sweden where the CIA first tested the program of extraordinary rendition after 9-11 on two Egyptian asylum seekers. Ahmed Agiza had been convicted in absentia to life imprisonment by a military court in Egypt for belonging to an outlawed Islamic group. The Americans had their eye on Agiza, as well as on a second Egyptian, Mohammed al-Zeri, who had never been indicted and was merely a casual acquaintance of Agiza. On the 18th of December 2001, Al Zeri was speaking on the telephone with his lawyer when dramatic events began to unfold. I had a telephone conversation with him at about five o'clock and uh, all of a sudden there was a voice in the background saying hang up and the telephone conversation was cut. The two men were arrested. They were brought to Bromma Airport an hour before takeoff. The plane had just landed coming in from Cairo. The men were sitting in cars outside a little police station. They were brought into the police station by the hooded and masked American agents. They were in civilian clothes, but they were wearing masks. And I opened the door and they came in uh, around about uh, 12, 10, 12 people. Uh, around the two terrorists and I went in, went in here in the office and uh, I showed them the, the, the room where they could change and they uh, went into the rooms and changed the clothes. They were put into handcuffs that had handcuffs and foot cuffs and then there was a chain through a belt around their waist and after that they were put on blindfolds and then hoods over the blindfolds and then more or less carried barefoot out into the December night on board the airplane by the American agents all of the time. The Swedish policemen who were responsible for what was happening, they stood, looked and did not know what to do and did not dare protest what was obviously crimes being committed on Swedish soil.
the Swedish government was content with a so-called diplomatic assurance signed with the Egyptian government. The agreement stipulated that Agiza and Alzeri would be repatriated to Egypt on the understanding that they would be granted a fair trial and not subjected to inhumane treatment. Sweden's politicians satisfied themselves at the time that the agreement would be honored. I kampen mot terrorism så måste vi samarbeta och det gäller att alla länder lever upp till också kraven på att respektera mänskliga rättigheter så att vi kan samarbeta på ett effektivt sätt mot terrorismen. Så därför måste det vara möjligt att verkligen kunna lita på att när länder lämnar den typen av garantier Sweden's tradition of respect for human rights was tarnished after the government cooperated with the new U.S. administration that had decided to continue the practice known as extraordinary rendition with renewed vigor. And this is where Canadian citizen Maha Arar has a story to tell. The Syrian-born Arar was returning to Canada from a holiday abroad in September 2002 when he was stopped in transit at New York's JFK airport. He was arrested without charge and held in this detention center in Brooklyn for 12 days. He says he had no idea why he was held, nor the fate that lay in store for him. On the 3rd of October 2002, at 3 o'clock in the morning, I came to the prison and I gave them food. بدون ثياب وفتشوني كيف ما فعل وبعدين نزلوني الأول طابق وقالوا لي القرار اللي أخذوا قالوا لي إنه نحنا حنبعتك لسوريا وأنا كنت طبعا بديت أبكي كنت في في حالة انهيار تام يعني انهيار تام ماها أرار was put aboard this plane specially chartered by the CIA to fly him to detention in Syria شفت راحوا لواشنطن قعدنا تقريبا نص ساعه في واشنطن ولا ساعه بدلوا هذا الفريق هذا الفريق تبدل طلع فريق اخر بدوا يحكوا مع بعض وكانوا عم يحكوا بالتليفونات فسمعتهم انه عم يحكوا انه سوريا رفضت تاخذني مباشره ولكن الان الخطه تغيرت حنبعته للاردن لانه سوريا ما بدها تاخذه مباشره Arar was eventually driven to Syria, where he was imprisoned without any charge brought against him. Arar says he believes he was deported because he knew this man, Abdullah al-Malki. In May 2002, al-Malki, also a Canadian citizen of Syrian origin, was arrested upon arrival in Syria, where he was visiting for the first time since 1987. Syria had nothing on al-Malki, but the Americans suspected him of providing communications equipment to al-Qaeda. Al-Malki was taken before a Syrian officer. التقرير ما صار له زمان وصل تقرير من السفارة ب 22 أربعة. فوقت قال كلمة السفارة رأسا انتبهت إنه الشغلة بتتعلق عالمية ما شغلة شغلة إنترناشنال شغلة عالمية ما هي شغلة تتعلق بسوريا بس. Almalki was eventually released after a year and a half in prison. No evidence was produced. No charges were made. Saying goodbye to him, a Syrian general hinted how Syria had felt pressured to cooperate in America's war on terror. وقال لي يعني نحن أنا آسف جدا على إنه مضيت هالفترة بالسجن وكنت بأمل بإنه قرار يعني كنت بأمل بإنه نقدر نطلق صراحك من قبل ولكن لو أطلقنا صراحك بسبب اللي عم يقولنا عنه إنه عنك يعني التقارير اللي عم تجي عليك. لو أطرقنا صراحة نخاف أنه يتهمونا بأنه ما عم نساعد بالحرب ضد الإرهاب ويأخذوا ذريعة ضدنا